and welcome to the program, this edition of Newsroom Series covering Nigeria Southeast. I am Bukola Koka. First, the top stories. Security operatives have foiled a bank robbery in the Abaji Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory. The operation was carried out at about 5 p.m. on Thursday by a joint team of the police and the military at a first-generation bank in Abaji. A statement from the FCT Police Command says the robbers also attacked the divisional police headquarters and the bank with dynamites. Combined security forces engaged and neutralized two of the robbers. Three of them were arrested, while the others escaped with various degrees of bullet injuries. One police officer lost his life during the incident, while a search operation is ongoing to apprehend the fleeing suspects. As Nigerian workers await the announcement of a new minimum wage, organized labor says it will continue to advocate for its 250,000 Naira proposal to come out as the agreed national minimum wage. President of the Trade Union Congress, Mr. Festo Susifo, who was a guest on our breakfast program, The Morning Brief, explains that there will be consequential adjustment for all cadres of workers when the minimum wage is implemented. Mr. Sifo adds that even after the tripartite committee negotiations, Labour is committed to working with stakeholders in order for its proposed sum to be signed into law. The meeting we had on this minimum wage, we agreed on that meeting that um, two, two numbers are going to be forwarded to Mr. President. That is the 62,000 Naira as well as the 250,000 Naira. So that was what uh, the tripartite committee meeting agreed upon. So uh, probably that has got to the, 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 the table of Mr. President. Uh, so what the president will now forward uh, now depends on a lot of factors, the consultation and all that, that he will now do. So for us in Trade Union Congress of Nigeria, uh, our understanding of that is first, there is no common figure that was agreed upon. There is no common figure. Then secondly, you have two figures that uh, the committee agreed to be forwarded to Mr. President. And a report on that was, was written, and we signed off that report. So all parties, uh, OP, uh, organized private sector, um, the government, and the organized labor signed off that document. That document was sort of an agreement, but that agreement is not on a particular figure, but on two sets of figures that will be forwarded to Mr. President. Some of the states that are not paying uh, the, the current 30,000, I think there are about five of them, according to uh, a subcommittee that the tripartite committee is set up, led by the Minister of Finance. Uh, they worked with, the, um, with, the, with MBS to come up with those states that are not currently paying minimum wage. So five states were identified. If you look at those five states, the fact that they are not paying 30,000 minimum wage, it does not necessarily mean that they don't have the means to pay. Uh, because when we check those states and we check the economic activities in those states and we check their IGRO, these are vis the allocation for the federal account, and also with the, with the number of workforce they have in such states, we realize that uh, they are not worse off in any way. So it wasn't really the ability to pay. It was more or less the willingness to pay. And we start in Anambra State, where the governor, Professor Chukuma Soludo, has signed 11 bills passed by the State House of Assembly. This formed part of activities lined up to mark the one year in office of the state's 8th Assembly. The vision of the 8th Assembly is to deepen the democratic process by championing the interests of the people of Anambra through effective, accountable, independent, and responsible representation. This has translated into the passage of these 11 bills that not only create order across the board, but also promotes the well-being of the people of the state. Top on the list of the bills signed into law are Anambra State Electoral Law 2024, Anambra State Touting Prohibition Law 2024, and Secret Cult and Similar Activities Prohibition Law 2024, among others.
And there's more from Anambra State as the governor, who was one of the guest speakers at the Democracy Day edition of the platform, where he gave many examples of what his administration is doing to improve the state's economy through the development of various sectors such as education, health, ICT and road infrastructure. In Anambra recently, we recruited 8,115 teachers and a thousand, little over a thousand medical professionals strictly on merit. And our teachers crisscross about 18 states of Nigeria. Our teachers are drawn from 18 states of Nigeria. It's not about where you come from. What is the interest of the Anambra child? The interest of the Anambra child is to be taught by the best teacher in the world not by the mediocre teacher from his village. That's what we must begin to program as a people, uh, so to speak. And so, and we appointed permanent secretaries and we have people from both Abiyam, Oshun, and so on, in our civil service, because they are the best that we could find, so to speak. So we must drastically reduce the cost of governance. In Anambra, for example, doing more with less is our slogan. Extreme prudence is the reason we are delivering historic results on infrastructure and all other sectors and still refuse to borrow a cover in over two years. The State Assembly approved for us to borrow 100 billion two years ago. And as we speak, we're still insisting that if we are going to borrow in the future, we will only borrow for projects that will have capacity to pay back. We have spent the first two years, we have spent the first two years restructuring our public finance on a path of sustainability, and I think budgeted. I saw your last thing on sustainability of the states, and Anambra happened to be in the top five today. Thank you very much, um, uh, so to speak. So, our budget is restructured to about now 23% on recurrent, why 77% for capital. We have cost, cost of governance to bare bones. For example, it used to cost about 137 million a month just to clean offices and so on and so forth. We've cut it down to 11 million a month. That's what it is. We have no office of first lady, and there is no appropriation for that. Um, my wife drives my personal vehicles that I came into office with. And um, we don't do this to impress anyone, but out of personal conviction and knowledge that Anambra cannot afford the West. Currently, as I said, Anambra is ranked among your top five on fiscal uh, sustainability. Our target is that over, and we'll probably achieve it sooner than later, our IGR should be able to pay for all our recurrent expenditures while any penny we receive from Abuja will be devoted to investing on the future of the people. In sum, we must reorder our, maxim, our priorities if we must maximize values for our people, given, again, the point I made before, that the resources are very little, very little. We must cut the fat, cut them off. So if somebody comes to me and says, give us appointment. Man to be appointment for what? Give me SA or SSA. And I say, what will you be doing? What will you be doing for a number of people? If I give you SA, you say, no, anything. I say, no. If I appoint you SA or SSA and you, there is nothing, no desk, no value that you'll be producing. If I call 20 KK Napep drivers and put them in front of you and tell them and ask you to tell them what you will be doing for a number such that at the end of the month, they will contribute all that they pay as their own payment will be used and to pay to you as SA. Will you be able to stand before them and give them that value proposition? No. We can't circle ourselves in the capital and not think that this resource that we spend is a resource that belongs to all the citizens. When we receive our fact, when we receive anything, it is money belonging to the 8.5 million residents of Anambra, not to the little circle that are in government. And now to the health sector. The Nursing and Midwifery Council of Nigeria, NMCN, has approved an internship program for the Enugu State University of Science and Technology, 
Esut Teaching Hospital and the indexing of nursing students at the Colleges of Nursing and the former School of Nursing, Agu. The approval, which is coming after nearly two decades of waiting by successive sets of the Department of Nursing in the state institution, was announced by the Registrar of the Council, Dr. Farooq Umar Abubakar, when he led a delegation of the Council's accreditation team on a courtesy call at the Government House in Enugu. While thanking the Council for the approvals, Governor Mbahu was represented by the Secretary to the State Government, Professor Chide Ebere Onya, regretted the stagnation of the state's nursing institutions for the past 19 years, promising to act on the recommendations made by the council to improve the nursing ecosystem in the state. I want to, on behalf of His Excellency, Dr. Peter Ndubi Simba, say a big thank you for your support to Enugu State and our vision for our nursing ecosystem. Because we look at it as an ecosystem. You pointed that out. There are three segments that he addresses. All those key three segments make one very holistic professional nurse. One is not going to be missing. You design the curriculum that addresses what is best practice. I have taken note of the curriculum comments you made, because this is important. If you're working with an obsolete curriculum, it is important that your measure at best is mediocre. That is not what we do in this state. His Excellency is going to get the, the, the recommendations from Dr. Jaye, and I am assuring you that I'll continue to put my weight behind what this team here is doing to ensure that the things you pointed out from logistics, transport for the supervisors to go back and forth, to curriculum being updated, to the buildings reflecting what we've thought to the hiring process. We are just even starting with nurses. We are about to hire new nurses for our tier two primary health care facilities. Nigerian medical students have called on the federal government to empower youths to break barriers and transform the health sector through adequate funding as they advocate for health education. The students made the call during a Health Week program held in Abakaleke, the Abonyi State Capital. Medical students across 36 states of the Federation are in Abakaleke, the Abonyi State Capital for a Health Week program organized by the Nigerian Medical Students Association with a the theme, Advocacy as a Fundamental Aspect of Health Advancement. They are promoting advocacy for medical education and reformation in the health system to help slow down the exodus within the health sector. These doctors in waiting stress the need to promote a sustainable health system through adequate funding. Medical education is not just necessarily to be a doctor. It's also what can you do as a doctor. With the knowledge you've gathered as a medical student, what can you do? So it's a whole process that goes beyond um, patients, doctor patients, to every other thing. So that's why we are saying, oh, government and every other relevant stakeholder should come together and support young minds like us in promoting a sustainable, good, and better healthcare system. Some of the challenges we're having now in the country, including Japan syndrome and what have you, you know, tackling it starts now. There needs to be, you know, a reassurance from the state government, from the federal government, and government at all levels, you know, on the side of the students, to let them know that upon graduation, that practice in this country matters. In the light of these concerns, the Abonyi State Government gives a reassurances of its commitment to healthcare delivery service by creating a conducive environment for medical students to excel, including employment after graduation. The government is supporting the students of Abonyi State in their education, seriously. And of course, you know, when you empower uh, students, we empower people to be educated, we have given them the base empowerment. I urge the government to put more attention in the health space, in the health sector, fund health, fund advocacy, fund health education, and also, very important, primary health care centers. In an effort to give more, the medical students, in partnership with the State Ministry of Health, take their advocacy on health education to rural communities where they work with medical doctors and senior consultants from Alex Ekweme Federal University Teaching Hospital at Bakaliki to offer free medical services, consultation, and counseling to residents. 
we are looking at providing better health services as young ones to these rural, uh, to the people in the rural areas to make sure that we have a conducive environment for health. And we are also looking at reviving, promoting ways to revive our primary health care centers to ensure that nobody is left out. Education as a vaccine is the main aim of this advocacy to improve medical education and good health system to protect the future of the healthcare space. There's been a clamor for the creation of more development commissions in zones or regions where they do not exist. The latest is from the Southeast, for which a bill to establish the Southeast Development Commission to manage infrastructural development is currently before the National Assembly. And joining us now to discuss the essence of the Southeast Development Commission bill is a hospitality and media consultant, Mr. Chibikim Diala. Mr. Diala, thank you for joining us on the program. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Now, this bill comes about uh, 53 years after the Civil War. And uh, part of um, the core values defining the bill is that it seeks to address the infrastructural damages suffered by the Southeast as a result of the Civil War. Uh, perhaps you'd like to highlight for us some of those damages that remain uh, from the Nigerian Civil War, that remain in the Southeast. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, the Civil War was a memory that um, nobody wants to really um, talk about, but it was real. More, more like the genocide that happened in, in Rwanda, where millions of people were killed. In the Southeast, we lost a lot of our people. So one of the greatest damages we experienced was a psychological damage. The damage to our psyche, to our people, our fathers who were then, who were forced into the war, the children who died of Bashoko, there was so much of um, health damages to the people. The mental, um, the mental questioning of who we are. The greatest challenge was the fact that the Igbos, the Southeasterners, were forced to begin to doubt themselves. But by the grace of God and by the resilience of the people, they overcame that particular challenge. So because we know we are strong people, they are resilient people, they are people of character and the people of power. Secondly, there was a major infrastructural challenge. Remember that then, after um, the war was ended, um, every single property owned by the Igbos outside the Igbo land were confiscated. They were taken away by the government, and the people lost all. Um, academic institutions were brought down, religious institutions were brought down, the markets were brought down. So the economy of the Southeast was brought down to the rubrics. Uh, and also looking at the road infrastructure, Beyond the things that happened during the war, what about after the war? From then till now, 53 years after, Southeast remains undeveloped. It remains um, challenged by uh, um, corrupt leadership. It remains challenged by a lack of focus on those sectors, educational sectors, the economic sectors, road infrastructure, hospital infrastructure, that should be able to deal with what the people really want to, to be able to take care. So I think that, um, we have suffered a lot, and it's time, it's high time that this um, development commission be comes into place. You know, in spite of that, many would just say that uh, the advocacy for this bill is just to fulfill all righteousness, because what um, is peculiar uh, to the Southeast that is not already found um, in other regions of the country in terms of underdevelopment. So uh, besides um, all of these that you have highlighted, that government is already... Um, addressing at the subnational level governors of su successive administration what do you think that this bill um is seeking to address in terms of infrastructure development in the southeast the truth is this there has never been um a consolidated uh, plan or program towards the development of the southeast with with uh, with um, recourse to what happened uh, during the war Yes, subnational governments, the different states have been doing their projects, you know, located projects, you know, isolated programs, which has not held, helped to build the, 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 the Southeast economy. So this bill, first of all, is going to, uh, be, uh, you know, seek towards harmonizing, for instance, the infrastructural development needs of the city, of the region. Secondly, to also look at, you know, a consolidated political needs of the people. Thirdly, for instance, um, in the whole of the Southeast, the key roads that lead into the southeast are all challenged. Is it the Port Harcourt Road? Of course, uh, the governments are, are working on them. What about the rural roads, the agriculture, the tourism infrastructure, 
So a lot of these have not been attended to over the years. So we believe that with the Southeast Development Commission, just like you have the Niger Delta Development Commission, there's going to be a proposed vehicle that has the structure to properly address these specific needs, for instance, in agriculture, for instance, in tourism, for instance, in road infrastructure, health infrastructure, and most importantly, for instance, in, in security. You can see what has happened to the region in the last four or five years or more, you know, over these issues of insecurity. Because what is the major reason for this security? The major reason for the uprising in the Southeast is because of the people want to, you know, be, in, there's inclusion. There's no inclusion in leadership. It's difficult today for you to say you want to be president of Nigeria from the Southeast. It's almost impossible because of this same fact, tracing from, you know, the, 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 the civil war. And there's this belief that the Southeast is, is minor, but yet we are not minor. It's a major ethnic group in Nigeria. So I believe that with the creation of this commission, you're going to have a special purpose vehicle. And if it's championed properly, I bet you most of these challenges that the Southeasterners are complaining about will be a thing of the past. For instance, there will be proper health infrastructure that should be able to address challenges from the primary to the tertiary, you know, health challenges that people experience. There will be also proper road infrastructure that leads to the farms. There will be security. Strong, because when you have this infrastructure, when you have agriculture, uh, industrial agriculture working, majority of these young people will find jobs to do. There will be no basis for people to come together to fight the system because you are seeing the system is working. So I believe in all sincerity that the Development Commission is going to do a lot for the Southeast region. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chibikem uh, Diala, for your time. There are more questions, but... We must manage our time now. We hope for a more opportunity in the future to expand this ongoing conversation. By the way, thank you very much, Ms. Sachibikim Diala, a hospitality and media consultant. Thank you. Cheers. The progressive Abia Youth Pay has advocated for the culture of transparency and accountability to be normalized and enshrined in the public service system to ensure public servants account for their activities while in office. President of the group, Mr. Kinsley A.K. Juba, made this known while addressing journalists at a press briefing to commemorate 25 years of Nigeria's democracy, even as he challenges the youth to be more involved in governance structure of the country. A major challenge to advance our democracy is endemic corruption facilitated by lack of transparency and accountability in government. With a 25% score, Nigeria also ranked 145 out of 180 countries in Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, CPI 2023. To deal with corruption and reduce its effect to repairs minimum, we recommend strongly that a culture of accountability and transparency be normalized in our public service system, ensuring that public servants give account of their activities while in office, not when they leave office. Because evidence shows that most public servants apprehended for what they allegedly stole while in office remit the simplest fraction of the loot when convicted. This recording episode is a huge threat to our democratic and international values as a nation providentially designed to be a beacon of hope for millions of black people all over the world. A threat that we must intentionally put to an end for our future's sake. Following the current electricity challenges bedeviling the country, especially the issue of erratic power supply and increase in electricity tariff. Academics of the Center for Nuclear Energy Studies and Training at the Federal University of Technology, Owerri, are advocating nuclear energy as an alternative source to electricity and power generation in Nigeria. Speaking at a one-day symposium at the Federal University of Technology, Owerri, Futo, the director, Center for Nuclear Energy Studies and Training, Dr. Ken Nawachuku says adopting the deployment of nuclear energy is a cheaper, reliable, and more efficient source of energy that will tackle Nigeria's power supply challenges. He says if Nigeria as a growing nation can tackle its electricity challenges by adopting the nuclear energy option, it will achieve more and there will be accelerated development in the country. We are all aware 
of the current energy challenges we have in Nigeria. We have tried the hydro. We are currently trying the thermal through the use of uh, natural gas. And thus far, it hasn't uh, given us the desired uh, results we expected from it. And uh, today, the world is looking for cleaner energies such that our climate and ecology will be preserved. And nuclear energy is the way to go. That's the only option we have. Nuclear energy is clean, it is cheap, and it is very reliable. But to the contrary, Nigeria has a treaty with uh, IAEA, International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, International Atomic en Energy um, Agency, to develop nuclear uh, capabilities for peaceful purposes. And among those people for peaceful purposes includes electricity generation, which is at the bane of our development. If we have as much electricity as we desire in Nigeria, Nigeria will be much more ahead than where we are currently. And that sums it up on the program for today. We'll be back again tomorrow with another edition covering another region of the country. Thank you so much for watching. I am Bukola Sota. Bye for now.